Nice. All right, we will uh, get to... No, 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 you're all good. That's very interesting, actually. Take us in, Sauter. Okay. All right, Nathan Bichez, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Yeah, thanks for coming, man. man. So we're here to talk media. It's a sort of crazy year if you cover the industry. 10,000 jobs by some counts have been lost since the coronavirus pandemic started. But what's actually crazier is that last year, 10,000 jobs were lost too. So there's obviously something deeper that's sort of going on here. So I think the sort of first question would be like, what do you think is going on in this industry right now? Zooming out from just sort of like the past three or four months. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of different things. I mean, one is like, there's local newspapers, right? Who employ... Uh, probably, I don't know, in the past employed probably a really large percentage of, of media workers. I'm not sure exactly how those statistics get counted or tabulated or whatever, but um, that's, that's obviously really struggling because a lot of the things that they traditionally did have gotten taken over, like Craigslist, you know, the classified ad section, that's a huge problem. National brands advertising, okay, that's just going in Facebook, you know, YouTube. There's like, there's all sorts of different channels now. Local brands, you can target way more specifically, um, you know, using Facebook ads and also just the importance of geographic advertising has kind of decreased relative since we can ship things over the internet now and buy things over the internet. Um, so a lot of the function that, that the sort of business aspect of local newspapers served um, has, has really gotten sort of um, decimated. Yeah, I think this is, this is like the key question, right, Nathan, which is that what went wrong there? So you, you have a yeah. pretty good state of, state of affairs, you know, we, okay, you know, clearly we're in a moment which is bad for media in general, or maybe it's not, and we can get to that. But what resulted in the state of affairs right now that a lot of people are lamenting? Because you see, you know, people are like, there's actually a lot of bad externalities if we lose local newspapers. It's very yeah. bad in order to have consolidation and all this. How did this happen? Let's tell that story. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's the story of the internet, basically. It's like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that used to make sense in an economy where information distribution was, was analog and, and printing paper and mailing it to people or delivering it to people every day was like the best way to get information out there. And now it's not. So that, that old kind of information distribution monopoly um, went away. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and there's a lot of other there's a lot of other kind of things that are better at serving the jobs that people are ultimately trying to get done when they, that they use the newspaper for and now they they use for other things like especially on the advertising front there's there's a lot of other you know it's it's not just from the um, like demand side in terms of their customers right the advertisers it's also from the demand side of like subscribers and readers um, right you know there's people it turns out people you know like to goof off on Facebook and Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And they're very interested in national topics and different kind of like dramas that may play out or celebrities. There's, there's all sorts of stuff that people are interested in that um, I think because the feedback loop and, and the data and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, there wasn't like algorithms sort of driving editorial decisions. Um, it was kind of nicely suboptimal. <laughs> it was like suboptimal in this way that felt kind of like calm and maybe a little boring, but at least calm. Right. And it could, could allow for really, I think important reporting to get done. And then now it's, it's harder um, since, since those structures have been eroded to, to sort of do that job. That's still important, but just maybe isn't the most like entertaining thing that like mass audiences want to spend all their time with every day. Right. Yeah. I think the thing that's really important here, sort of, I like to imagine what this conversation would look like if the year was like 2013, 2014. Right. So like, cause I think what's cool about all three of us is we're all sort of working on different media properties or in different mediums. Right. So you're working on Substack. you know, you're working you know, with the written word. I'm sort of doing the podcasting side, Sagar, you're on YouTube. Um, six years ago, we'd have been talking about, okay, man, like, Nathan, how are you getting this on Facebook, right? How are you making your content go viral, man? Like, how many clicks are you getting? Like, that's what we'd be saying, but like, that's just totally gone away. Like, the, the, the sort of thing, everything has changed there. So I think what I think would be really useful for our listeners is sort of getting people to understand, like, how different the world online is looking in 2020 from what it sort of was a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think th- so. So we've, we've been focusing on like the really long term shift of like local newspapers and that kind of stuff. But there's also this shorter term wave of like, you know, basically at some point around 2000, like 10 ish, um, Facebook started sending a lot of traffic to like articles that would go viral. And there's right. just a huge amount of people on Facebook. People like to share articles. So this whole sort of like industry sprung up to supply the kind of articles that would go viral. The biggest example is BuzzFeed, obviously, but there's a ton of other companies that do similar stuff. Um, and even, you know, like newspapers and like really, really sort of like big institutions, or maybe that's not their bread and butter, but they'll still do that to get some, to get some traffic. Um, 
And, uh, you know, Facebook decided that that wasn't the thing that they wanted to promote in their algorithm anymore. They tweaked their algorithm and, and the traffic just, as far as I understand, I wasn't working at any of those companies during that time, but, but you know, the traffic was substantially impacted. Um, so so I, maybe, I can actually explain a little oh, bit yeah. on this. Tell, you know, tell this this yeah. actually happened. Uh, I mean, I used to work at the Daily Caller. This is, I mean, a lot of the strategy, the traffic there was all built on uh, Facebook. And I remember very, very distinctly what happened whenever that Facebook algorithm change happened. I mean, it was like, I mean, it was huge, right? And, ma- and it's, it, it really is, it killed an entire brand, IJR. I mean, does anybody even remember IJR anymore? This, that was their entire strategy. So just, I mean, from somebody who actually like worked in it at the time, it was really devastating. And Nathan, one thing I'd like you to pick up on there, which is that a lot of brands for some reason actually built their entire models on that temporary algorithm change. Right. Why do they do that? I mean, was it just short-sightedness? Was it the idea, was it a lack of imagination that Facebook could change it more? And is anybody going to make that mistake again? Well, it'd be hard to because you can't build very much on top of it, right? Because articles don't go viral on Facebook in the same way they used Mm -hmm. to. Um, But I mean, you know, there's still stuff with like Google, right? Like any, any time that people are coming from some other platform and treating you as kind of like a, a commodity where they don't really care who wrote this, they're just in and out because it's like there's a headline that happened to catch their eye or whatever. And it was like worth a click, but not something ultimately that they actually care about and, and, and think is important to them. Then you're just renting traffic. And so for a while you could build a pretty decent business off renting traffic. And I don't think the people who are doing that thought that's what they were doing. They felt like they had a community. They felt like they had this direct relationship. Right. Yeah. We're, you know, going around the old gatekeepers. We're going direct on Facebook. And it's like, well, Facebook turned out to not be so direct, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and maybe the same pay. thing will happen with email, right? Cause like we don't, yeah. who, who controls email, right? Like what percent of people use like Gmail, Yahoo, and like, I don't know, whatever, whatever the other big email providers are, but there's like a, it's pretty consolidated. Um, and, and so there really is no such thing as like direct, direct other than I guess in person or something like that. So like, mm. there's always mediating forces, right? Um, I guess it's just more of a question of like the stability of, of the way that they've mediated and email tradition right. has been a lot more stable, obviously than Facebook. Um, but why people did that is cause I think that it, it didn't feel like, um, this just felt like the new world. It's like, okay, cool. There wasn't Facebook before and now there is. And the way things work now is you get traffic off Facebook. Cool. It's a channel shift. Great. It's like mm-hmm. there wasn't TV and then now there is. And so you can like build content for TVs and that worked. That was stable for like a really long time. Like network TV and then cable TV. It's like, it just was sort of additive over time. Um, it, it would be hard to imagine like why it would go away if there's some new channel that came up that just felt sort of inevitable, you know? Um, is pretty counterintuitive. You can put yourself in, in, you know, the shoes of people doing that back in time. Right. Yeah, and I think the best way of sort of illustrating this is that any of our listeners who were sort of on Facebook, going to BuzzFeed, going to Mike, going to different places, try to think of a writer who you were clicking on, right? Like you weren't, I don't know, I cannot remember a single person. I was reading BuzzFeed every single day. I could not name a single writer there during that period. Same with Vice and all these sort of places. And I think this is the perfect pivot into what you are actually doing now, right? So you're building this newsletter brand at Substack and it's very sweet, sort of very related to you, right? Like it's Nathan is writing at everything. It's, you know, you and Dan, your co-founder are writing yeah. these things too. So I think that's, if we're saying we're, I think just like you said, we were at a new era in sort of 2010. I think we're at another era too now, which is much more about personality like Sagar. Crystal and Sagar at the Hill. Right. It's not like the Hill. Like no one's clicking to watch you guys to get generic sort of takes there. So I think that's what's new now. Yeah, totally. And I think it's I think it's more stable ultimately because another human being that is going direct to their audience, like under sort of their own banner, has their integrity on the line, right? Like they have the relationship with all those audience on the line, and so it's a little bit easier, I think, to like optimize too hard and, and, and sort of squeeze, you know, dollars out of your audience or attention out of your audience or whatever, when you're like a manager making a decision on behalf of a brand that you could just part ways from in a couple of years. But like, if it's under your own name, I mean, there's like skin in the game, you know? Right. Um, and so I think, I think it's a really great force for increased quality in, in media. I think it's really interesting, Nathan. I mean, look, the people who listen to this podcast, many of them are people who very much want to support independent media. They want to support people who are going out, doing their own things, being able to work outside the mainstream. And one of the things I've been really fascinated by is actually their interest in the discussion we're having right now, which is that, yeah. you know, kind of the wonky side of business and media business 
economics. And I think I realized what they realized and what everybody kind of has is that if you don't understand how that business works, the people that you love could actually just disappear. I mean, look at so many publications, papers, people all across the country who are just unemployed. And kind of like with that, I would like actually to talk about the long-term viability here of Substack and kind of what you're doing. Marshall kind of put you on my radar and I, I was like, wow, like this is, you know, somebody's really looking at these dynamics. So, I mean, let's talk about the long-term viability kind of of what you're doing. You're an independent Substacker, but you're also part of a bundle. Yeah. Is that the way that the, that, that things are going to trend? Like should, if people are looking to support independent media, should they support a bundling? Because that could be a little bit counterintuitive, you know, because the moment there's a hierarchical structure, maybe they're going to tell you what to start saying. So let's dig into right. that a little bit. And right, quick totally. thing, just build on that. Can you define like what Substack is and like what's different? Yeah. What's, what's, what's the difference between Substack and Patreon? Because I think most of our listeners think of Patreon when they think of independent creators. They're not thinking right. of Substack. So sorry, yeah, question is the right one, but Substack first. Yeah, totally, totally. And I should also qualify, like I'm hopelessly biased when it comes to Substack because I was like the first employee there after they, like right after they raised their kind of like seed round of, and, and I worked there for a little while and it's just an awesome team. And, um, you know, we parted ways like very amicably. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a happy Substack uh, booster basically. Um, mm -hmm. So just to get that out of the way, Substack, basically the way it works is um, it's, a, it's a platform where you can sign up, you create a publication or a newsletter, whatever you want to call it, and you can create writing and you click publish and it goes on your website and it gets sent out to everyone who subscribed to your email list. And it's just finely tuned to make this model work for independent writers. The idea is like they do everything except the hard part, which is writing, right? Right. And so the model is really based on um, the success of people like Andrew Sullivan, who had um, you know, his independent site for a while. Now he actually just joined Substack. Um, and Ben Thompson, who writes about media and technology and sort of like the business strategy uh, of big tech companies. Um, and he has a site called Stratechery that's been really pioneering the space and just like super successful. Um, and, and, but the problem with those things is you had to set up a lot of different systems. You had to like maybe like create a WordPress site and integrate some other membership plugin and then figure out how it works with MailChimp. And it's like, it should be easy. You, can, you should just be able to sign up, start writing stuff, hit publish, you know, connect your bank account and, and go. Um, and so that's what Substack did. And, um, there's a lot of people who just use it for free. So you don't have to charge for your work and you can just use it totally in free mode. And it works kind of like any other blog or like tiny letter kind of thing. Um, or, you know, then whenever you've got an audience and you want to go independent, you want to earn some site income, maybe you're shooting for it as your full-time thing. You can turn on subscriptions, set your price. Um, and then every time you publish, you have the option to send it to people who are only paying or send it to everyone on your list. Um, so that's like the, the basics of how it works. Um, Patreon, Patreon is similar. The big difference is Patreon is a little bit, um, I would say like has a little slightly different philosophy of, of how sort of these relationships between fans and creators can work. And then a little bit of different functionality. That's like a, a sort of extension of that philosophy. The philosophy is it's like, I think it stemmed from YouTube creators who had a big fan base and no good way to monetize that fan base. You can get yeah. like hundreds of thousands of views and like you get a check from 10 to, from YouTube for 10 bucks or something like that. Um, <laughs> You're triggering Sagar, careful. Can attest to that very first Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, a lot of those people, especially your core people, maybe like you get 100,000 views for video and a thousand of those people just love it so much that they'd be willing to pay you. And you don't even have to like, promise anything specific you're just like hey support me right. to keep doing what i'm doing be my patron hence patreon the idea mm -hmm. of being a patron of the arts is you're paying for something that the public gets to enjoy right um hence patreon substack is more built on a traditional like subscription model where it's like it, it, it's an exchange i have some exclusive content that you you got to pay for in order to read it's like a book it's like a magazine you got to there's a price um right. And the, the big innovation is really just like bring, bringing that to the level of an individual writer rather than needing a whole publication and a newsroom and editors and all that kind of stuff in order to, to run the business. Well, one thing could you clarify for me? Because as I understand it, on Patreon, you don't have all the access to the same amount of user data, uh, fan data that you do via Substack. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I would okay. suspect that it's true though. Like on Substack, you can put in like Google analytics or whatever. And right. so like, there's, there's probably a lot of data you get on Substack that, and you can export a lot of your data out of Substack too. Right. Um, the big difference is on Substack, you own your Stripe account. 
So when you when you're charging subscriptions, um, you know you could dis, you could disconnect your Stripe account from Substack if you want to, and it's still your relationship with with your audience. Um, I don't know if it's going to be that way forever. That's I'm pretty sure the way it still is, but they may have changed it since since we signed up. But with Patreon, it's kind of like if you want to move off of Patreon, you got to like tell everyone to punch in their credit card somewhere else, right. which is obviously you're going to lose a lot of people. And that doesn't mean you have to shut it down. So you could like for everyone who doesn't cancel, you could still kind of keep collecting on Patreon and like do like a transition over the course of months, but it's just, it's a huge pain relative to like really controlling your, your relationship with your audience. Yeah. And this is the big idea that matters here, right? So like earlier, and I think I, I, I love how you're able to like dive into these details, but someone may have missed this. The whole reason why people go to big publishers like the New York Times or BuzzFeed is that all of the crazy back end stuff are really difficult, right? Like obviously like you can definitely do WordPress about like learning to code, but like Ben Thompson's like pretty frank about like, when he was setting up his stratechery in 2013, like he had to do all of those things themselves. So what Substack and, you know, other sort of competitors are able to sort of do is they're able to say like, hey, like you can just write now. So you don't need a gatekeeper. If you're like Matt Taibbi, right? Another person in Sagar, like right? the Crystal Sagar universe, right? He's someone who just writes and he's able to actually like, probably, I'd say, like have a more successful business than he would before. Like Andrew Sullivan could piece from New York Magazine because it's not a good fit because he doesn't fit into this big institution. When back in the 70s and 80s, right, when the whole sort of value proposition for the, you know, big publisher was like, hey, like, Good luck writing your little newsletter, right? You'd have to be like, you'd have to be like Ted Kaczynski, like e like mailing out notes to everybody, like over mail. Like, it wouldn't work. It'd be a logistical challenge, to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I just think that's so interesting. I mean, one of the other things, though, right, is that Nathan, we have this explosion of independent creators. We have this massive Patreon thing. We've got Substack. We've got it's probably never been a better time to be an independent creator, but we also kind of have like monopolization within the mainstream media. Do you think that that feeds each other? And what I'm talking about there really is like the New York times, right? Like you said it yourself, which is that there's an obsession with national stories, be it sports, be it, uh, be it celebrities, be it politics, kind of the realm where Marshall and I are probably most well-versed. And yet like, we've seen the times and the Washington post, they're probably doing better now than ever. And it's very counterintuitive to a lot of people who are like, oh, newspapers are dying and all this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. These, these are becoming like massive, you know, basically tech companies as we covered right. in an earlier episode with Balaji Srinivasan. How did that happen? What's the dynamic at play there? Yeah, definitely. I think it's really, really important to say the whole first part of this discussion when we're talking about newspapers, that was like local newspapers, yeah, not, right. the, yeah, the New York Times has more in common with Netflix, right? Than like, than, than a local newspaper yes. um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but how, how did it happen? I think because, um, you know, you, when you go on the internet, you can curate your attention however you want. Um, the, def the defaults of the platforms tend towards um, national or international stories. Those are the things that people are talking about. Um, it's just like, I think also there's like this, this, it's like this mimetic environment almost where like, it's just so like, if you can get someone to press the retweet button, then that's what people see. So the things that are most retweetable are the things that the most people see. So like, what are those things? How are they related to the truth? Like, it can be a fuzzy relationship. A lot of times, like there's this really, um, there's this blog I'm a huge fan of um, called Slate Star Codex that oh, yeah. um, has a post detailing the, the dynamics of this called the toxoplasm of rage, where um, basically oftentimes there's, there's sort of a weird incentive for like the worst version of an argument to be the thing that most people see because it's the version that makes up the other side the most angry. And so we get sort of like avatars of the other of the other side sort of like in, in our social media feeds and it makes us it makes us sort of think that they're this monolithic like terrible thing when in fact there's more complexity and nuance and humanity kind of on, on on different different sides of issues but it's the worst version of the argument that kind of gets amplified in, in social media so um i i buy that argument um and i think that um you know the there's there's a little bit of like a winner take all effect in terms of like sub subscribers because the more subscribers you have, the more resources you can put into better content, which means the more subscribers will generate because you have better content. And it's the same dynamic. It's, it's an accumulating advantage that Netflix has. It's, a, it's an accumulating advantage that Disney has. It's also an accumulating advantage that the New York Times has. Mm -hmm. I, I think what's interesting about that is that 
that entire dynamic basically is something that a lot of people sort of underestimated, right? So like going back to the whole, like, what would this conversation look like in 2013 idea? In 2013, like, let's say we were all like, hey, like, let's build like a podcast, YouTube newsletter empire. We'd be like, look guys, at the New York Times, it's like super old, they have this old legacy brand, they're the taxi companies, we're the Uber of content. And then that was sort of the story. I think a lot of like, like billions of dollars in venture capital like went into that story. The problem with that story though, is it just undercounted exactly what you just said, right? Which is that like, hey, like the New York Times is a legacy brand. People know what it is. Like that's actually like something very helpful. It's yeah. something where you like, you have like all this brand equity. I saw her like, you know, risingly blew up over the last year, but I think people undercount the fact that if you didn't have the hill by your name, people wouldn't oh, yeah, sort of see no it. Way. There's no, there's no chance. And, and like, I'm actually pretty honest about it. I'm like, yeah, like, I think we got really lucky. There's a lot that goes on here. Yeah, it was absolutely because we were attached to a mainstream brand. And in fact, that's part of really a lot of the mystique. And I guess what's interesting, I mean, Marshall, you can, I mean, I'd love to get Nathan's input on this. One of the things that we've kind of seen is that the more that the Times kind of leans into its subscriber base, right? So like, it's not a secret who subscribes to New York Times, upper middle class, white liberals, right? especially in metropolitan cosmopolitan areas. Okay. So the more that they kind of pander, or I wouldn't even say pander. I mean, deliver Seriously. the product that the, yeah. deliver the product that their subscribers want, the less they become the paper of record. And that's like a really counterintuitive thing where the more successful that it becomes kind of the less national cachet it will have. And I get, that's just a dynamic that a lot of people are not grappling with right now. I, I agree with that. I think that the, there is no, there is no record anymore. Like we sort of live in this era where there's just like different universes of it's like, a, it's like a different, totally different way to tell a story about the same facts and uh, mm -hmm. not even the same facts in a lot of cases. And um, it's like, you know, basically so hard to reconcile the differences at this point that it's just totally different universes. And it's just like so depressing because obviously there is only one physical actual universe that we know of that we're all living in that at least that's, that's what it probably is. Um, but, but there's, you know, it, it, it seems so impossible to like have conversations where you can start to reconcile the differences because, um, you know, there, there are differences in philosophy where there's really long feedback loops. I mean, sometimes you get things that are short feedback loops and you can tell who was right or who was wrong. But um, not very often with this kind of no. stuff. Um, yeah, and so, and so it's, I think that's sort of the nature, the nature of the problem. And, and um, yeah, it's like, I think that, I think that the New York Times is doing the strategy that is correct for the New York Times to do. Um, not just even from a revenue maximizing perspective. It's like, I think a lot of times people ascribe um, like, malicious intent or selfish intent or something like that on people they disagree with when in fact it's just like they really believe that like it's their mission yeah and no, you may disagree right. with sure. their beliefs and disagree right. with their mission but it's like they're doing it earnestly there's a lot of other things that a lot of those smart people who work there could do that would probably make them more money like on wall street or whatever like they're in the same town as wall street they're really smart they could have gone a different direction with their lives and their careers and it's not like a lot of the individuals there are like just making bank or whatever um you know, so I don't think it's a malicious thing, but I do think it's it's basically the right thing given the worldview and philosophy. And like a lot of it, like just just to expose like my bias, like I kind of agree with, but I also mm -hmm. can like sort of step outside it and say like, I, I get why if you don't agree, it's not uh, it's not a satisfying read, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> it, it makes sense to me. Um, and, and it sure. sucks to me that there's not something that does, that could feel like a satisfying read to us. Like I'm a huge fan of the dispatch, even though I, when I read it, sometimes I'm like taking notes and disagreeing and, you know, whatever, but like, I find it um, a, a useful intellectual exercise. I find it, I find it fun as someone who like, you know, went to college studying political philosophy to like, to, to read that stuff. Um, yeah. Even, even though I kind of, I kind of disagree with them a lot of times, but I think they're coming from a good place, you know? And mm -hmm. I wish, I, I wonder if that's like something that'll happen more often because of subscriptions, like their dynamic is like, they have an audience that, um, you know, wants quality and they're only willing to pay if it's like actual quality, like the kind of thing that's worth sitting down with on like a Sunday and like taking an hour to like really read, you know, like why would someone mm -hmm. do that if it was just sort of like written for to be shared around on Facebook a whole bunch of times, you know, that's a good. There's point. so much, there's so much there, seriously. Um, part one to my response, I wish you were sort of there for our, con like, I wish we could have beamed you into our conversation with biology because biology was talking, you, you've heard the stuff of like, Mm -hmm. you know, blockchain graphs of truth and facts. And it's like, that's not the issue, right? Like the way that we sort of explain it, you know, and our listeners will hear this in the episode is that fights in media about truth are never about like someone saying like the sky is red. 
blockchain graph, it's actually blue, right? That, that, that's never actually the issue. Like, yeah. There are very few issues that like, aren't just sort of like that subjective truth. Um, like we usually agree about object, and it's really the sort of like the opinionated things that come in there. So I think that's always like an interesting thing. So I think that's point number one, but sort of point number two to your dispatch example, I think that actually gets at a weakness of the subscription economy, right? So like, obviously like we're huge fans of subscriptions, right? Like I subscribe to everything. I think it's great. I can support your work. But part of the problem though, is that I, it's, I think it's going to hyper create filter bubbles, even worse than the ones we sort of have right now. Right. Because like, now it's like, Ever since, for example, like National Review, um, I used to intern there. Um, I used to read their stuff more, but they have a paywall. And like, honestly, right. like I already subscribed to a bunch of things. I'm not gonna subscribe to National Review. So like I've stopped consuming their content now because it's not just free anymore. So like, how is we- William F. Buckley's about... turning over in his grave. <laughs> it, yeah, it's over, you know, it's- He's uh, shaking uh, his head at us. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, but it's an issue, right? Days. I think this is a good pivot into what you're doing with sort of bundling, right? Which could be a solution to it. Cause like, right. you, you, you're, if, if there's a, I think the flaw in the system is that like you have to pay for the dispatch and everything and the New York Times separately, right? It's not as if cable requires us to subscribe to Fox News and Rachel Maddow. So do you think there's any sort of broader lesson that could sort of be there? Yeah, that's an interesting one. You know, and the dispatch itself is kind of a bundle, right? It's like, it's a tiny, it's a tiny bundle relative to like, you know, Netflix or like Spotify or something like that. But I mean, um, the default model on Substack is that like, you know, David French and Jonah Goldberg would like do their own things separately. And like the other writers right. there, I don't, I don't know all the writers, but like they would all kind of have their own Substack, but instead they've teamed up. Right. And so like I came into it more because I had heard of Jonah Goldberg and I wasn't as familiar with David French's work. And now I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm being introduced to like, other people in the bundle who um, kind of have like their own style, their own topic focus, their own voice, but, mm -hmm. but work together. Um, and, and so I, and there's also this very real thing in like bundle economics where it's like, essentially like I, maybe there's a publication that I'm a casual fan of, like, so I'm not willing to pay the, the price that sort of is the market cleared price because like it's, it makes more sense for them to charge the higher price and to only monetize their super fans rather than to monetize their casual fans and like sacrifice all the revenue that the super fans would have paid had the price been higher. Um, but the cool thing about a bundle is it's like basically a way to price discriminate where you can like flatten out the demand curve a little bit. And it's like, okay, the cost of this is we don't know what inside the bundle you're a super fan or a casual fan of, but we're going to assume like you're a super fan of two things and a casual fan of four things and like a non fan of like, uh, the rest. And right. so given that you're willing to pay like X dollars and then whatever kind of fits underneath that curve, like is, you know, that's the stuff that, you, that you'll end up actually consuming in there. And as long as their stuff doesn't get too much in your way, everyone has gotten more value because you've spent more money than you would have otherwise. And, and the creators are receiving more money than they, than they would have otherwise. And everyone's happy because you're getting content that you want, but maybe just you wouldn't have paid for individually. Mm -hmm. Let me bring up something really juicy and which actually I didn't know why, but my audience loved it was this call her daddy saga uh, oh, with right, Barstool. Yeah. And so like, it kind of reminds me of this, which is that, okay, like the dispatch is a media company. You can also think of it as like a mini bundle. I guess you could probably think the same thing of like the Barstool podcast network. So how do you prevent kind of what happened with call her daddy, right? Like you have these two girls who they get discovered basically by Dave Portnoy. He brings them on, blows them up. They become one of the biggest podcasts in the world, really, they're always at like the top of the charts. Yeah. And they're like, wait a second, we're not making close to the amount of money that we're bringing in for Barstool. I mean, at one point, I think Portnoy revealed, Marshall, you can correct me, did they make a hundred grand an episode in advertising they were, they revenue? Were, yeah, they were losing, by, by not air, yeah, they were making a hundred grand an episode. So they're making a hundred grand an episode. They're doing an episode a week. So, I mean, you could do the math 52 yeah. times a hundred K. They were both pulling in only like half a million a year. But they were also, they never would be call her daddy without Barstool. So how do you right. prevent basically the fallout that from, you know, them trying to jump out, them having like wrangling over the IP in a situation like that? Yeah, it's fascinating. I think this is the force that's going to cause a lot of turmoil in media over the next like several years. And it'll, there'll be a shakeout because all of a sudden there's a better BATNA for creators. I can go direct to my audience and make more money. Let's, let's so, explain BATNA. Let's oh explain yeah, BATNA. BATNA. Best alternative yeah. to negotiated right. agreement. So it's basically like, okay, Barstool, um, if we can't figure it out, I've got a good other option. So I have more, I, I have, I'm willing to say no to like, you know, more essentially than I would have otherwise. So like now if I'm, you know, a writer at the New York times and it's, it's, it's my salary renegotiation time, I'm like, Hey, you know, I like working here a lot. It's really tempting to like go to Substack. Um, I think I could do it. I think I would probably make yeah. like 
four hundred thousand dollars like in a couple of years uh you're paying me a salary of like one hundred seventy thousand. so like let's let's fill the delta you know a little bit mm-hmm. and it's like literally creators just have more power now partially they always did right like before substack people like ben thompson and andrew sullivan did it but the difference is it's becoming normalized now it's like oh, over and over and over again people are succeeding at it and so there's a growing confidence that you could do it and it's that confidence that shifts the negotiation um, and so maybe it'll, it'll change because a whole bunch of people will leave and then they'll fail and then they'll come back. And like, you know what I mean? There's like cycles of this stuff that play well, out. Re- yeah. Sullivan did leave. I mean, he, he left and he, came and he had to go yeah. back to New York mag and now he's back on Substack, which is maybe that's kind of like the true story of the industry, right? Maybe that's what you do. I mean, honestly, it's not that different, I guess, from my career. Although I have like this tiny, like nobody microcosm, but like I, I've, ping ponged between starting companies and joining companies <laughs> that's been it's like okay i'm gonna give it a go and then if it doesn't work i'll go and like recharge like emotionally and financially and then i'll give it a go again <laughs> once i'm like recharged basically uh-huh. um and, and maybe that's what maybe that's what people in media increasingly do instead of going from publication to publication they go back and forth between, between going on their own for a little while and then going into publication but hmm, that's interesting i think like I think the more likely thing is that there's a new crop of media companies that will emerge with more favorable, scalable terms. It's not out of the ordinary for that to happen. Like if you look at Hollywood, if you look at like even book publishing, right? Like the way it's structured is more centered around um, talent, right? Or it's like, okay, the complexity that creates value lives inside a person or a group of people's brains that are like actually creating the content. That's where all the value lives. So like they should capture all that value because they have options. They can take it. They can take that value a lot of different places. It lives with them. It is them. So, um, you know, I think that, I think that there's basically room for new structures like defector is an interesting, really, really recent example where, um, it's like a writer cooperative type thing. And, um, you know, with our bundle, we're thinking through what do we want to be with when we grow up? How do we attract the best people to work with us? And we're growing up in a different environment from, um, you know, if we were starting a publication like 10 years ago, when it's like, let's create stuff that gets shared around a lot on Facebook and it doesn't matter who wrote it. Now it's like, people are fans of, of people in their brains. And like, yeah, we, we need to attract right. the brains that are going to generate a lot of fans. And so we need to offer them a good deal. And so, um, you know, that we're think we're thinking about it totally differently. And um, I think that there's a lot of companies that'll either have to rethink it if they already have structures in place, or we'll start from scratch like we are with just sort of different assumptions baked in. Yeah, it's um, Antonio um, AGM on Twitter just had oh, yeah. a good sort of prediction where he was, we need to get him on the show, by the way, Sagar. Um, oh, yeah. he, had a, he, had a, he, had a, he had a good prediction where he was like, I think in 2022, 2023, there's gonna be like a mass, like mergers and acquisitions phase for Substacks. What I sort of think is gonna happen here is you're gonna have all these sort of people who are gonna sort of like spin off, like sort of do, create their newsletters, create those sort of independent things, right? But I think what's gonna happen here is this is gonna be very similar to blogging. And I wanna hear Nathan, you would respond to this sort of scenario because I think people underestimate how similar this is to what happened to blogging in the 2000s, right? Because every single story that we're telling here was replicated back then, right? So like you have all these old institutions that like don't give favorable terms. You have people who, for example, there were people like, you know, Ezra Klein or people like, you know, Megan McArdle who definitely like had an audience that was separate than the publication they're at. They went off on their own, they blogged. But here's yeah. what happened, right? Over the next three or four years, like they gradually like had kids. They're blogs got bought like and they sort of like went things and that's the I, I, I love how we're sort of getting to the cycling idea but I think I think we're really just going to cycle through there and the thing is though is that what you also said was that things sort of changed a little bit so like once Ezra did go to go to the Washington Post he had more control right he had walk right. like Nate Silver had 538 and these were things that they could leave afterwards so I think this is going to change I'm just curious what your thoughts are and we're just full of conscience in here but I think yeah it's- yeah, totally. I definitely, I definitely think there's a lot of similarities to it. I think it could be stickier this time around, though, because, um, you know, you had an audience, but it was really hard to create a business back then, right? And so it gave you some leverage, like, the reason why, yeah, like, Wonkbog was able to be what it was is because he had already developed his voice and his audience, and so it sort of de-risked a different way of writing stories, um, right. And, and so the Washington Post was like, oh, cool. Yeah, people love that. Let's just do it here. And like, it doesn't totally fit with our editorial voice. So we'll call it Wonk Blog and it'll be its own thing, you know. Um, and um, but but, you know, the reason why uh, probably he joined the Washington Post is like probably probably for like the colleagues, the mentorship, the, the distribution. There's a lot of stuff there. 
but it would have, I think, been a little bit of a different calculation if he was looking at um, like an ARR and a chart that was going up gradually and you can like extrapolate let's, the let's line. Explain let's ARR, explain ARR. ARR, annual yeah. recurring revenue. Yeah, annual recurring revenue. So it's like, you know, imagine your salary, but it's like set by customers. So it's like, how much do you make in a year if you went on right. for a year at this current rate? And so, you know, if you have like a thousand subscribers paying you a hundred dollars a year, then you've got a hundred thousand dollar ARR. And so a hundred dollars a year, seems like a reasonable price. A thousand subscribers doesn't seem like that many people, a hundred thousand dollars a year. It's like, you know, pretty good salary. Like you're not Mm -hmm. getting rich off of it, but like the, the, the cool thing is if you want to make more money, you just write great stuff. You don't have to go like renegotiate with somebody, you know, um, every single piece you publish is going to get you new audience and new subscribers. And the better your piece is, the more quickly it grows. So, um, you know, if you're looking at a graph that's like linearly, or maybe even like exponentially heading upwards, um, then it's a much harder decision to go and like join, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like at that point, they're acquiring a business with cash flows. And so you value it based right. on a multiple of revenue versus just like hiring somebody, you know? Um, and so the cost uh, of acquisition is going to go now. up. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think, yeah, wow. That's, that's fascinating just in terms of what it would require and why it might be a little bit stickier. And, you know, one thing I want to make sure that we indulge everybody in is that we, we just heard this term on the Bill Simmons podcast called Quibi porn where everybody just is like fascinated by the downfall of this like, massive project. Uh, it's a and I, I know that, you know, you're, uh, you, you've been well-versed in this. Okay. So what happened here? This is a, this is an app. And I, I think this is very instructive because at the exact same time, you're doing what you're doing. I'm doing what I'm doing. We're doing what we're doing here on the podcast here. You have these, you know, Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg, two people worth hundreds of millions of dollars each. I think Meg Whitman might be a billionaire. Mm -hmm. who come together, they raise all this money and they create this app, which is supposed to be for young people. It's going to be the new medium. And it's like epically failed. So what happened? Like what exactly is going on? I don't, it's certainly not going as well as they would have hoped. I don't know if, I don't know if it's fair to say it's epically failed yet. It seems like that's Okay. See, that's important, right? That's important. It seems like that's the path it's headed towards. But I think at this point, the narrative is like so far against them. It's like people assume almost like the company is shut down. It's like, no, they're still releasing stuff. Like they still have, they they have a lot of cash. $700 million in the bank. (laughs) And a lot of money, but. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so like, you know, they could turn it around. Like, it's funny. I wrote, um, you know, so my, my, my newsletter divinations is about strategy and, uh, you know, everyone was basically very skeptical of Quibi. Um, and and I, I was going to write a piece for their launch. And so I, I was thinking through like, okay, how do I, how do I analyze this? What are their chances? What is, what is most important for them to get right? What is it all going to depend on? You know, and the more I thought it through, I'm like, I haven't seen the app yet because it hadn't launched yet. I was going to release the piece the day that it launched. The more I was like, you know, maybe it could work. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like writing this like contrarian take basically, which in retrospect is looking kind of wrong, but I don't think actually any of my core like theses were like totally invalidated yet. I think it's more like they made some execution failures, especially on the content and marketing side that like, I, I it was hard for me to predict maybe, or like, I don't know. But so like, basically like, I think that if you, when people, when people tend to sit down at night because they have like hours of time, they tend to go to a place like Netflix. So right. like they could go to YouTube, but they prefer Netflix. So the revealed behavior I think is that if you have specialists creating content that they're like highly paid and like highly talented, that that's going to be more entertaining with like more investment going into it into like production values. That's going to be more entertaining in general and went out in the market for attention in general than like, you know, um, stuff that like anyone could produce cheaply. Um, and, uh, the only kind of stuff that's getting that kind of that level of investment and that level of talent is the stuff that it takes like, you know, at least 30 minutes, but most of the case TV shows are an hour long and, you know, movies are a couple hours. So like nobody's making stuff that's like shorter form. That's like more similar to like TikTok or, or mm-hmm. like stuff that people watch on the go. And I was like, it actually like, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't it work? Hollywood is like a fairly predictable API is what I thought which I think maybe was a little bit wrong. I don't know. For whatever reason, the content hasn't worked. Basically with Quibi, I think is like a big part of the issue. And I think the marketing, the marketing was also really wrong where it was just very focused on Quibi and not focused enough on a show. Like if you have a tent pole that just looks interesting, nobody cares if it's on Quibi or not. You just like, Mandalorian. oh shit, I heard this thing was really good. Yeah, we got to right, watch it, you right, know? Exactly. Um, yeah, no, you're exactly. Yeah, um, would, the Mandalorian, right? Mandalorian is, as I understand it, is what made Disney Plus, Disney Plus. Yeah, uh, totally. I mean- yeah. And this is why it's interesting, right? And, and I, I think 
to sort of zoom out for a second, I think the reason why the Quibi conversation matters is there's this whole debate in this moment what the future of all these various industries we sort of look like and sort of look like you're you're like the everything bundle, right? Like we do need to like pump what you're actually doing in your day yeah, job. Like everybody subscribe, everything everybody subscribe. Yeah, subscribe, <laughs> it's very decent price. The everything bundle is like decently organic, right? In the sense that you start writing, it starts working, like, you know, Dan, he's writing, you guys have similar audiences, but your content's like a little differentiated, you go from there, right? Like. So, like Crystal and Sagar, like obviously, like it's not quite organic, but you you do a show and you see whether it grows. Same thing with this podcast, right? But with Quibi, you're trying to sort of brute force that future. You're like, look, like Jeffrey Katzenberg, and by the way, guys, like especially to our sort of like, I think we're all similar ages, so like late stage millennial ages. Like Jeffrey Katzenberg wrote your early childhood, right? Like he's yeah, the right. person, Lion King, the best '90s. So like, it, it really, it, it, on a personal level, it, it feels very sad, and it's sad that he's just sort of getting dumped on. But he's Shrek, he did Shrek, right? Like he did, he did so many things that I'm not quite sure that Gen Zers will appreciate at the same level. But the point is that they tried to brute force this future with a billion plus dollars, right? Like Nathan, you guys didn't raise. 10 trillion dollars to try to build a bundle you sort of did so i think that's why this is so interesting because it's just yeah. it's testing whether or not you can brute force the future it, i i think you're right i also i have complicated feelings about it because like um the the idea that they wanted to test was that hollywood style content in short form on mobile would be something that people want and so um you can't really test that without actually creating Hollywood style content and you can't actually create Hollywood style content without like the money to pay for it. Um, right. And so like it's, and, and, and then like how they, they use the same mechanism that everybody else uses in Hollywood, which is like, okay, you're like, we've got cash. We want to get stuff produced. We're producing shows. Like let's go work. Let's put projects together. Let's like, okay, who's, who's, who's the screenwriter on this? Who's the director on this? Who's the star on this? Like they're just doing all the same stuff with all the same people that make, the kinds of things that make Netflix a success, the same basic talent base and supplier base is creating stuff for HBO and for Netflix and the rest of them. And um, it is like, I, aesthetically, I really like more organic things. I think you're totally right that it's like, there's something that feels like not right about it. Um, I, I have, I think you're probably ultimately right, but it's like, there's this disconnect that I haven't figured out how to resolve where it's like, they're also kind of just an, ex it's like a sustaining innovation for Hollywood more so than it, it's like a disruptive innovation, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can, uh, I mean, some insight from the Bill Simmons podcast, which was, I actually want to be a little bit more fair, which is they were like, look, I think the real issue was not the idea. It was that Quibi had money and they had people who were willing to throw it at like what Matthew Baloney, the guy on the podcast was saying was like, somebody's seventh best idea, right? Like right. not their best idea. They just had way too much money. They were desperate for content and they were just willing to pay for anything rather than going out and trying to get something actually good. And the prediction that he made on the show, which I thought was interesting, was they actually only need one hit. He's yes. like, look, you only need one hit and then you're good. Like you can actually turn this whole thing around. So, I mean, they do have 700 million in the bank. You could probably buy a hit out there. The only question is, is like, do they have the people to recognize a hit? And I think that that's the, that's the difficult more creative part which yeah you can't fry, you can't price that in right that's why like before launch not having seen any of the shows i was like okay like they have all this money they have jeffrey katzenberg hollywood is a predictable ish api like people prefer hollywood style content when they have a lot of time i don't know any reason in principle why they, they wouldn't prefer it when they have a small amount of time <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah, it was like right. it all added up to me to like this actually could make sense um but i I think actually the other thing is it's actually still not fast enough. Um, like compared to TikTok, it's like agonizingly slow. <laughs> you know, it feels yeah. it feels like it's actually way more in the realm of like, oh, I need to have like forty five minutes or something like that than like, I don't know. It's just not like in TikTok you're entertained within like three seconds or something like that. And w with Quibi, there's like setup and you know, it's. I think mm -hmm. it's. I think maybe actually the problem is like screen screenwriting is not tuned to like internet mobile attention spans. You know. Um, right. but creators organically discovering what works in the market have converged on something that's like way faster, um, than what the Hollywood screenwriters are doing. And maybe the screenwriters are actually the wrong people to do it. Maybe you should, maybe, I mean, this is, maybe I'm actually making the case, um, for your argument. It's like, yeah, maybe you actually, what you should do is like take the people who are already doing it and invest in them to do it at like slightly higher production value. Exactly. Right. Um, exactly. and, and then go from there rather than, I mean, there, but then there it's are like these, TikTok like, should just do that. Right. 
<laughs> right. But, but I mean, the they thing are, is if they're not doing it, right. I don't know if they're not doing it. So they have a $200 was, million dollar fund for creators. It was like just announced. See? There you go. So I would go to one TikTok of those. is the actual Quibi. <laughs> right. Hype think, houses and just pay all those kids to do something for me. I, I think this is interesting because earlier we were sort of saying everyone's sort of underestimated legacy media and sort of legacy brands. But I think Quibi is like a key case of sort of overestimating it because I think what's interesting here is that what you could have had happen, we sort of were talking about this just now, is that you could have said, hey, like, let's find like the best TikTok people and like pay them, like you said, like above market to do premium style TikTok content. But what, but what happened here, like the shows they have on Quibi, it's, you know, a most dangerous game, you know, most dangerous game of um, Liam Hemsworth. You've got, you know, a punk to remake that literally no one asked for. So, so I think, I think, so I think the, the, the thing that I would sort of say here is that I, I think it made it seem earlier, like I was saying, it's a mistake just to like raise money and to do something big that's not what i'm arguing i think the issue here was it's a mistake to raise money at such like a, a high valuation if you don't have sort of product market fit um so it, so for example like it's pretty clear that people like tiktok content but I, I just don't think there was actually any evidence beyond jeffrey katzenberg's sort of going for one last you know one last like right off into the sunset with like this idea that people wanted short form more and the here key thing too mobile only high quality context. I don't think that's just real. I, I, people listen to podcasts. Like if you have 15 minutes, that's a podcast. That's what daily podcasts are used to report. So I think that was the real issue here. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. And, and I think another thing, I guess the final segue here is you, you made a mention there. People either want long form or they want short form. Like people very much know they're like with TikTok, you know, they, within three seconds, like you're in same thing on Vine, you know, if we can ever bring bring vine back and maybe we should <laughs> what, what was that joke marshall is like we need a war production board to bring back yeah, someone, vine. Someone <laughs> just, the second the tiktok band came up someone just tweeted that we need the <laughs> wpb for that <laughs> yeah we need, well, we need an industrial policy for vine exactly um, well that's basically what we have bite you know that's by the same people yeah. Uh, so there you go. Okay. So, but the, the point I was trying to make was, you know, we have the short form, but we also have the long form. And like, look, I had the privilege, the guy that, who pioneered this, I had the privilege of going on Joe Rogan's podcast. And I mean, we were there for three hours, three entire hours. It was a fascinating discussion. Joe is so good at actually moving the conversation. I mean, as somebody who does this for a living, there is no man alive who is better at making it seem organic that he's moving a conversation along in a very interesting way. And I can assure everybody who's listening, he's not just like having fun. Like it's very intentional the way his brain is working, but he's not like taking notes or anything, but there's a, you know, people out there are listening to somebody talk about chimps for three hours, like three right. entire hours. And then the next episode on neuroscience and then the next episode on politics and then the next episode on you know, beating the shit out of each other in MMA. And yeah. I think, I know you wrote something on this, you know, based on his, his new deal with Spotify um, and just about open podcasting. Obviously this podcast, we care about, about the open podcasting environment. What's, what's your read both on why Rogan himself and that medium is so appealing, but also what his move to Spotify means for the whole industry. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I'm curious what you learned from Joe Rogan. Like you, you were talking about how like amazing he is at conducting an interview and facilitating a conversation and how like, it seems like yep. it's just this casual thing where he's just hanging out, but it's like, it's very, it's skillful, right? It's like what did you pick up from that? Yeah, it's incredibly skillful. And the thing that I really learned about him and wh where I see other people fail whenever they try to do this is that he has the perfect barometer of whenever somebody seems to be droning on just a little bit too long, he'll interject with a story or an anecdote and he'll kind of read the room. So what he would do is he like, you know, he actually watched Crystal and I. So whenever I think that the conversation was getting slow or something necessarily, he would interject and be like, what about this thing? Um, and he would know that that would set me off, right? Because it was very much like a study of the subject. And I've watched him with others, um, especially with authors. I notice people who aren't used to you know, like us or me in particular, like I, you know, I talk three hours a day and I do this podcast. Like I, you know, you don't really need to set me off. I'll, I'll keep talking all day he's very good at drawing it out. So, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch some of the most random stuff just to see how he does it. Somebody he's just met. And that's the thing about Joe, like you meet him for maybe five minutes before you sit down in there. Like he doesn't like to do the whole, like talk too much in the green room. Cause he's like, no, 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 we got to get this all out on the podcast. So that was the other thing. He's, he's got a genuine curiosity, but he also is very audience aware. He's always aware of like, Hey, like I got to interject this conversation. I got to make sure that we move the conversation this way. We got to make sure that I bring the best kind of like out of you. 
And I see that in authors in particular, like I said, like authors will be like, well, this is kind of like what my book is about. And he'd be like, yeah, but tell me about the writing process. Like, what did you, and he goes, wait, you went to Spain? Like, what was that like? What was Spain yeah. like? And the, having the intuition to ask that type of question as an interviewer, like I said, somebody does this myself, very difficult. It takes years and years and years um, in order to learn. So yeah. It's hard to interrupt people. The absolute king. Oh, it is. And that's, oh, see, this is the other thing where, I, I struggle to time. do it just now. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. But I cut you see, off to say how it's easier it when you and I are talking um, here, but, and it was easier to like on my own show, we have time delineation. So like 10 minutes, right? So it's like, okay, we're cutting it off at 10. I'm like, Hey, we got next question. Right. But with Joe, there isn't any of that. So he's like, he, he, he also uses just like figure, like speech. You know, I do this sometimes too, where you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that like intuitively kind of registers with guests where they'll be like, oh, he wants to say something too. And I've just, mm -hmm. I've studied Rogan a lot um, and having kind of experienced it myself. So that's the most amazing thing I've yeah. studied. I think everyone has a vision of you, but, you know, 6.30 yeah. on a Sunday morning right. studying with Sensei. I mean, maybe I'm giving you a game because I think, I think maybe some people like the idea of it all just being like organic. It's not, man. Like this takes a lot of work. It's incredibly hard. This is so funny because this actually came out um, after Barry Weiss wrote her like pro Rogan uh, New York Times piece last May because she was like, because she had this quote, and this is what's so funny. I love what you're, what you're hitting here is like several things. Like, one, I don't think people realize that Rogan's been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, right, guys, imagine if we, right. 10 years from now, we keep podcasting like once a week. <laughs> I hope we're very good at this. But, but two, it's like Rogan in the piece quotes, he was saying, oh yeah, like it's random and it's super chill. And then Barry's like, oh yeah, like, you know, people love how authentic it's like that it doesn't actually work that way and i think there are too many people yeah. whose podcasts go too long who are too unstructured and are sort of like not seeing the quiet part out loud which is that it's super hard to do that yeah and look joe is 52 years old he's a actual martial artist like a black you know whatever the highest is um he's actually like incredibly well read um he's deeply like knowledgeable in sports science and he's a comedian a professional comedian since the age of 18. So the amount of expertise that he brings to each one of those topics, like he's got just an affable personality where you're like, oh, it's Joe. It's like, no, he's actually like a legit expert in pretty much all of the fields that he brings people on for. Right. So, you know, it took 30 years for him to know enough about MMA to kind of bullshit about MMA and make it seem fun. But that level of expertise, it doesn't just come overnight, right? Like you actually yeah. have to be a legit expert in something to get somebody to listen to you the way that Rogan spends all of his time talking. Yeah, totally. It's like, uh, I forget what the quote is from, but there's something that's like, how do you create the perfect painting? You have to like become the perfect person and then paint naturally. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's it. Oh, that's exactly uh, it. Become yeah. the perfect podcaster. <laughs> that is the goal of all three of us here. Exactly. And then that's speak right. naturally. I think that, you know, Spotify's, Spotify's goal is to be a place that's just synonymous with podcasts in addition to music. And to have to do that, there, there's a lot of stuff they're they're going to be able to do. They're going to be able to do um, discovery the same way that playlists with music are like you know one of the most important vectors for like artists to get discovered now is like if you right. get featured on a Spotify playlist, like they want the same thing for for podcasters. And that would be a really great thing because it's very hard as a podcast to like get discovered. Like there's just not good mechanisms for it um, in, in the same way that there are for music. Um, and so um, they want to do that, and, and and but they'll be able to do a lot of other interesting things because they have basically they're they're the only layer that sits between um, podcasters and their listeners. With the open podcast ecosystem, it's based on these standards that were set like in the early two thousands, basically with like very small tweaks at the around the margins since then. And so the basic experience doesn't and can't evolve because you have a lot of there's like a lot of fragmentation. There's too many layers. And so uh, there's not enough. No, no one has the ability to coordinate the layers essentially to like to move and they need to, they, they need to coordinate if they want to change because you basically, we upload our, you know, as podcasters, we'll upload this file to like a server somewhere. And that server is probably a service, uh, a podcast hosting service that's structured to fit what podcast apps expect. And they don't, they can't really affect what the apps want. So they just have, they're, they're limited by the apps. And then it goes to the app and the app is limited by what all the different podcast hosting companies have. And they can't really affect all those hosting companies. So they just have to deal with what they've got. And so they're sort of like mutually locked in with each other because there's like right. just enough different apps and enough different hosts that nobody has the market share to be like, but what if it worked a different way? That would like be a little bit better. And, and YouTube 
I have a theory that like part of the reason why um, in the U.S. audio is such a like podcasts are basically such a more niche activity than than it looks like audio is becoming in some other markets. Um, like I, I don't know a ton about it, but like China, there's there's some platforms that are really huge that are like they pay for them audio. too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and they pay for them. Um, I have a theory that part of the reason why it is what it is and like why video grew so much faster than audio here is because with video you had like YouTube. And it was that same thing where it's like Spotify, it's just one layer between creators and consumers. And so they can like introduce changes and they're basically like, Hey, creators, now you can do this. You can add like a little link to your video. You can add like mm-hmm. a, you can put in our commercial and you can use music. And so you'll, it'll, your video will be demonetized, but like whatever, we can still have it in there or whatever. You know, they have all these like innovations they can make and little tweaks to make the experience better um, that no one has the power to do in podcasting because it's open. But the nice thing about it, I mean, there's a, there's a plus side to it too, which is that no one controls it. So like maybe YouTube does some stuff that you don't like as a YouTuber, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and in podcasting, nobody has the power to do those kinds of things. And so people are both excited and worried about it because basically Spotify is trying to be in a position very similar to YouTube um, for, for podcasts. Um, and so, you know, by, by doing this deal with Joe Rogan, um, that's basically a way to signal like, hey, there's a huge amount of fans here. Spotify all of a sudden has gone from like optional. You didn't need to use it at all for podcasts for like, you know, millions of people to like required if you want to listen to Joe Rogan, which they do. So basically required. And now if I listen to like that show there, and maybe that's my anchor show. That's like my favorite one. Then I'll just start listening to a bunch of other stuff there too. Cause it's pretty nice. And like, well, it doesn't really matter one app versus another. They all work basically the same way. Why not just keep everything there? Right. Um, and so they're able to move a really large amount of people onto like using Spotify a lot more often. I, th- I think what's so fascinating, and, and you, and you, by the way, we should mention you, you worked at Gimlet, which is also acquired by Spotify. Yeah. So there's conflicted there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's uh, thanks. Yeah, we got to note that. But I think I think the thing that's hard for people to understand, I think, is what would a better sort of podcast system look like, right? Because part of the issue is that you, you, you were, I, I think we're all, I, I bet we're all iPhone users. You sort of open your iPhone, Apple podcasts, so there's, you sort of go there. People don't really have a good vision of what a better open system would look like. So could you sort of go into, as a, you know, you have a great um, podcast that you, um, that you do. I think it's with Dan, right? Yeah. Um, what would it, what would, as a podcaster, what do you want from the ecosystem, from an open ecosystem? Um, well, it would be amazing if, um, when someone listened to another show that was kind of like mine, my show appeared in the sidebar the same way it does in YouTube. Right. Right. I mean, that's huge for YouTube is like, you, you're watching one video, here are a bunch of other videos that are kind of like it that you might also like that we can recommend to you. Um, that stuff makes a really big difference and it just doesn't exist in podcasts and podcasts. You listen to a show and it just shows you stuff about that one. And then you want to find something else. I guess you got to go somewhere else. You know what I mean? There's a lot of friction to that. Um, you know, another good one would be search, right? Like, what kind of episodes would we create if we thought that there was a lot of people searching in like some good podcast app that's like, oh, like, you know, like even for example, like, okay, so Spotify, like does this deal with Joe Rogan? The day that happens, how many podcasts came out? Like where are people like, so maybe if you already subscribed to that podcast, you'd find it, but a lot of other people probably searched. And then what kind of results do you expect from a podcast app? It's like not very good. And you know, Apple's working on improving it. They've, They've definitely done some stuff in the recent past, but it's just, it's hard. They're hamstrung by the fact that they don't really have very direct relationships with, with the creators. Creators are um, sort of structuring their activity in the same way they always have. And so you can do better if you're like, you know, oh, here, here's a way to introduce like tags, keywords or whatever, you know, like just basic stuff like that. Like, um, you know, that, that specific example, I think there actually is a way at the podcast level to do keywords, but probably not at the episode level, but there's just like little things you can do um, that are unknown right? It's like, it's less about um, what's the specific thing. Cause it's kind of hard to predict like um, what specific innovation is going to make a huge difference. And like YouTube is the analogy I'm using. Cause it's like that stuff that worked really well for YouTube, but maybe it's different in audio and there's different innovations you need, but regardless, no innovation is happening. And so <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like, I'm not sure what's the right thing to do, but it's probably not nothing. <laughs> you know, right. uh, that, that's, that's at least the way that I think about it. I think um, we're, we're almost at time. So just to finish up, like, let's just hear, I would bet you're optimistic about the future of media. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of like, what's, what's, what's here? Like why? Actually, here's a better way to put it. You're jumping into this space, right? At the worst this space has been in, in decades, right? Well, not in decades, but in terms of, in terms of the 2010 to 2020 sort of period. Like, why are you sort of like optimistic about the field in general moving forward? Um, 
because because a lot of things are changing right and so ch change is like the basic kind of like food that startups feed off of right it's like if there's a change in the world it means something got broken and then broken things require fixing and so that's where new startups can come in with different kinds of models and fix things and like so um i i don't know exactly what we'll end up building we're very experimental about what we're doing and we definitely have like a vision of the kind of thing we want to create but we try and be pretty responsive to like what what feels like it's working actually um and we try and do things organically and just like one step at a time. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I'm excited. I'm excited for it for those reasons. I'm also just like, honestly, I think I'd probably be doing it regardless if it was a good opportunity or not. <laughs> like Recharged I'm time. not fully <laughs> rational <Recharged>. about it. <laughs> exactly. I'm not fully rational about it. It's just sort of like maybe at some point during my lifetime, it will be a good, it will be like a good business opportunity and at other points in my lifetime, it won't, but I'll probably be doing it the whole time regardless, <laughs> just because <laughs> I find it fun and I like to think about things and write about things and talk about things and to be able to be around that, to be able to facilitate that, like help, help new voices kind of develop all that kind of stuff just feels like really fun. Um, and so, you know, even if it's kind of like a rough business, it's like people who start a restaurant, like you're not doing it because it's like the restaurant industry is so right. great. You're doing it because like you love it and that's like, it's fun. And so it's worth it to you, even if you're not like getting, going to become like, you know, Jeff Bezos or whatever. Um, mm. So like that, that's mostly the way I think about it. It's not like I'm doing this because I thought it was like a great opportunity. Although also I think right now is a great time. It's like, that's not the whole reason, you know? Yeah. Well, before we go, Nathan, uh, tell everybody where they can find you, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Substack, all that. Yeah, Twitter, I uh, am N-B-A-S-H-A-W, in Bashaw. That's my old last name, but I haven't changed my handle yet um, because I would lose my verification and I'm vain. Um, <laughs> but um, Never change. And, yeah, yeah. And I, then, know how, um, I know how much we have to covet that check. I know. Yeah, I know, right? It's funny how Blue Check has become associated with like liberal journalists, but whatever. Right. Else. <laughs> um, but um, and uh, the um, yeah, my Substack is divinations.substack.com. That's where all my writing is on strategy and a lot of the stuff we talked about today is stuff. Quick that question: How did you get? This is a very important question. How did you get your check? Honestly, when I started my last company, uh, which was like s sort of a media company, it was like mobile, tappable, visual storytelling. Um, it kind of like almost like Instagram stories, but like with like sort of professionally written and like it does an auto advance and it's like like professionally illustrated and that kind of stuff. Um, kind of like a comic really. Um, basically, like you could just apply back in the day. Like they had a yeah, form that you could yeah, just fill right. out and I just filled out the form I, and I'm like, I, I run too. a media company. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's a small tiny <laughs> company, but like it's a company. Um, right. And uh, I just got it. And honestly, I'm at the point now where I'm like, I should just change my Twitter handle to like my new last name. Like my wife and I merged our last names when we got married and like, she doesn't want me to change it. She like likes the blue check. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. It doesn't like, it doesn't matter. I think the one benefit is I think most of the time, if I follow someone, it sends them a push notification. It does. It doesn't always do that if you, so like, you know, maybe that's cool, but like, what do I, I mean, should I really care about that? Like, I, I feel like sort of the douche, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm conflicted as you can tell. Right. Well, I think you should keep the check. Uh, I'm with your wife uh, as a former, as a fellow blue checker. But uh, Nathan, this is a great discussion. Really, really interesting to a lot of things our audience cares about. So thank you for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Welcome.